Uh, so I'm actually really glad to be back here. It's always a very long trip to come to India, and I just came through London and other places, so it's been long. But I always enjoy coming here, uh, in part because I always find that the culture um, here is not what I encounter every single day, and I always like meeting people who are not exactly like what I see every day, and that's great. Um, why I'm using a Windows laptop is actually related to that, which is that I, I actually also have an Android phone for a few years. I was actually one of the people who waited online for an iPhone originally, uh, like waited on the very long line. I didn't get one, actually. I had to wait on a second line. So I was a big iPhone user, and I was a Mac user for a long time. Um, and part of the reason I switched is just to try to understand like what is it that people are experiencing when they're using other devices. And that's not just a, an altruistic thing. Um, one thing that I find is that quite often there's a device, there's a, there's a tool or a device that has gotten quite good, but people are stuck in their old ways and they don't notice that the thing has gotten good uh, since the last time they checked. So I like to, not every five minutes, that would be very annoying, but every few years I like to try something that I hadn't tried before. And uh, usually it's like when my last device runs out. So in this case, the Apple hadn't shipped a new MacBook in a long time and I was getting tired of waiting for one. Um, I broke my screen, so I was like, yeah, I'll just buy a Windows machine. It's been working great. I've been really enjoying it. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that's a good practice anyway, just to get out of your comfort zone and try out things that you, didn't, that you weren't using or you weren't thinking that you would use, um, especially if you've been hearing, well, this thing might be, have, might be better than I expected. Um, so the thing I'm going to be talking about today um, is Ember, um, more broadly, like the future of the mobile web as we see it uh, working on Ember. Um, I live in Portland. This is the Portland version of the Ember logo. You can see he has a, a donut and a mustache. Um, the Seattle version is pretty similar to that. It's, Seattle is very close to Portland, uh, f physically close. I should have put it on the slide. Um, every, both cities are full of hipsters, uh, but there's some subtle differences that if you live nearby, you would understand. Um, and I just came from London, uh, where they also have their own Tomster. Um, I noticed you guys also have one that you, like an uh, unofficial one. You guys should definitely, I think for like $100 or something, you can get like an official one drawn by the original uh, person who drew them. Uh, and that's basically just like the cost that it costs her to do it. You should definitely do that because these things are pretty cool. And um, I, I always love going to cities and seeing like the thing that they have going. Um, but I don't want to, I'm going to stop talking, babbling on and on about these things and move on to uh, what's the topic of my talk. Um, so if you've ever heard of Ember or looked at Ember, you know that our tagline is um, ambitious web applications. And uh, me and Tom, who work, uh, who, who run Ember, um, both think that the trend uh, on the web is clearly towards more web applications. Um, we're getting technologies like Service Worker, uh, push notifications on the web. Um, so the web, mobile web is actually becoming a first-class app, application platform in its own right. Uh, it's no longer just like that thing that you might run some stuff on in some device. It's starting to become something that is its own full-fledged platform. Um, and as we saw happen on the desktop web, once you reach certain, a certain critical mass of functionality, uh, users tend to prefer shareable, installation-free web applications to applications that they have to install on native. So it's very unusual on the desktop to see applications that are you know, native first or where the primary application is, na is a native app. Um, a lot of applications are actually web only on desktop. And we don't see that so much on mobile, but a lot of that has to do with getting a, a certain critical mass of functionality. Like uh, today, we're only starting to get push notifications on the mobile web. And of course, that's a very important feature for mobile applications. Um, so it's just a better user experience to, avoid, to not have to go through an installation process. And that, I think, is going to mean not necessarily that every application going forward is going to be web application, but that we're going to see more and more web applications and more trending, more towards the story uh, that we've seen on desktop um, and away from every single thing having to be a native application. And what we sort of think of Ember's job as being is being the, an SDK for the web. Um, it's basically the tools that you need to build a great web experience. And in particular, Ember doesn't want to be the platform, and we also don't want to port a native platform to the web. Um, what we think the web is missing, and what native platforms have, is an SDK that helps you manage complexity as your application grows, and helps you package and distribute your application optimally to your users. Um, and what we as Ember people want to do is build a solution that doubles down on the strengths of the web. We want to uh, focus from the bottom up on, building a world on helping you build a world-class web application. And uh, specifically, what we think is that web applications are not just, quote unquote, good enough applications. We think that they have real advantages for users um, over native applications. 
So let me talk about what I think, uh, for, before I talk about what ambitious applications means in the context of the mobile web, I first want to talk for a second about what it means on the desktop. Um, on the desktop, when people say ambitious web application, usually they mean something like a long-lived workspace application. And in those contexts, people are willing to wait a few seconds to boot the application because they're going to live inside the application. This is things like uh, Gmail or uh, the Heroku dashboard or Pivotal Tracker or something like that, where once you load it up, you're basically leaving the application up for, for minutes or hours or even days at a time. And because using the application is people's primary activity at the moment, they accept a little bit of extra load time if it gives them a snappy, productive UI once it's loaded. But th while that's how things work often on the desktop, on mobile, the idea of a long-lived application doesn't even really exist. Um, mobile is really for quick interactions. Very few people are sitting down for hours on end working on their Android phone, even for native applications. Um, and I think that's... Uh, that's actually a pretty important thing to understand. Even if you have an application that you might use a lot, like Twitter or Facebook, so people might spend hours and hours, or WhatsApp. Someone might spend like you know, 10 hours a day in WhatsApp. Uh, that's still, that application still has to load up many, many times per day. Uh, the, op the operating system can kill it at any time, any time it wants. So really, you, have to, you can't get away with saying we're going to accept a certain amount of load time in exchange for the fact that you live in all day. You really have to accept the fact that this application gets booted up many, many, many times per day, even if a user uh, lives inside of it. And interestingly, um, as I was thinking about this, what I realized is that, in principle, this fact, the fact that people are booting up this app uh, many times per day should really give the web an advantage because the web already places a premium on instant interactions. Uh, the web does not require an install step and it is already a very harsh requirement that when you click on a, a link on Google, you don't have to wait 10, 15, or 20 seconds to get what you're looking for. So there are all these techniques on the web for building applications that have very quick load times relative to an installation step. So you would think that they had, the web would have an advantage here. But Unfortunately, uh, getting to a situation where you have a web application that in fact delivers uh, something that feels competitive with native really requires you to build an architecture that I would say has three, has three parts. Um, first of all, and this is like pretty independent of what framework or what library you use, this is I would say the optimal way of building an application, a modern mobile web application that, is, that loads and, uh, quickly and continues to be responsive afterwards. So first of all, the first thing that you want to do is deliver just the raw content, um, ensuring that people on slow connections or without JavaScript at all uh, get what they're after as soon as possible. So that means give them just the content. Uh, after that, we want to load just the minimum set of JavaScript that we need to add interactivity to the page, keeping the transfer time uh, of the initial JavaScript payload and the parsing time of the JavaScript payload uh, low. And then once the user is happily interacting with the application, then you can go and download uh, other parts of the application, including frequently accessed data, which will mean that other interactions on this page or other visits to the page, you know, coming back from the home screen or coming, uh, coming back after you switch to uh, respond to a text message, um, subsequent vi visits and interactions can then be nearly instantaneous because you have downloaded all the uh, JavaScript that you're ever going to need uh, and no longer rely on the network just to do simple things. Um, unfortunately, building an application that works like this is incredibly hard. It's historically been very difficult. And you've probably heard sort of two stories here. So progressive enhancement, if you can take the time and effort to do it correctly, gets you the first two phases, right? You, the, prog the story of progressive enhancement is that you give the HTML first, and then you progressively enhance it using JavaScript. But unfortunately, this approach inherently relies on server-side rendering, when a lot of the ways that people want to build rich client-side applications involve client-side rendering. Um, and that means that any kind of network flakiness makes interacting with the application feel slow, because after the first click, the second click, the third click, and the 50th click all still require hitting the network, even though the user might not have access to the network. And I think that's actually quite ironic, given that the story of progressive enhancement has always been a story of, of making things work in as many environments as possible. But of course, increasingly, the environments that are popular are environments not with slow JavaScript, but with slow network connectivity, right? So uh, trying to design an architecture where every single interaction requires going back to the server is just a slow, uh, can make your application feel very slow. Um, also, in terms of the programming model, you have to manually separate out the behavior and the presentation of your app. You have to do that manually, uh, rendering HTML as one part of your program, and then manually wiring it up to the Java JavaScript code after the fact. 
And because of the fact that this feels very complex, it's hard to do, a lot of developers prefer the experience of using frameworks like Ember, Angular, and React to writing progressively enhanced applications. It's just a lot of details to get things right. Um, on the other hand, fl on the flip side, um, we have this need to get things resilient. On the desktop, this is actually pretty simple. On the desktop, it just means get your workspace app up and running, keep the JavaScript running in the background, and now you can live in it for a, a day, and your application is resilient. It's running your JavaScript. But like I said before, on mobile, that doesn't really work. You can't actually run an application and boot it up and keep it running because the operating system will keep killing your application. So on mobile, what this means is making subsequent interactions, whether they're from inside the same app or coming back to the app afterwards, as fast as possible by running them right on the device, rather than having to communicate off over the often slow or unreliable network. So the idea is that you, on, on mobile, what you would like to do is still have the initial requests involve HTML and a little bit of JavaScript, but quickly get to the point where most interactions involve JavaScript that's already on the device. And Phase one and phase two and phase three all have real benefits, but getting to build, as you can see, building an application architecture that makes this work is actually quite difficult. Um, if you want to go after resilience on mobile, what almost everyone does is build a, mo a native application, right? Because native applications give you the guarantee that even though it might take a very long time to download the application, once you've downloaded it, you are resilient. You, are, you can run things offline, right? So uh, people, people build these native applications. And, Really, what this has done is it has caused the world to get polarized into two camps uh, the, when people think about mobile. The lightweight JavaScript people who say that instant load times are paramount, important, and they, those people often ignore the bad network scenario, um, and people who prefer to develop native applications, and those people take a big hit on initial load times, but, uh, perhaps multi-megabyte application down, uh, downloads, but you get guaranteed functionality when you're in a bad connection or no connection at all. And those things are kind of a polarized world. What we would really like to see is to have all these three things coming from one application. And let me give you an example of something that happened to me recently that really reminded me of why this is important, why we care about web applications. So uh, I had this really terrible experience. I was talking to Tom, and he was like, come meet me at this coffee shop. And this is actually a real thing. This is a real IM conversation that I had. So he sent me a link to Foursquare with the map. And before I could do anything at all, it said, hey, you need to download the application, plus some error. So I said, OK, fine. You want me to download the application? I'll go download the application. Uh, so I go download the application. And what you can see is, first of all, it actually takes some time to download. Um, this is actually simulated. It's much faster than the actual download, because I actually was on a 2G connection. <laughs> so of course, it took a very long time to download. But and it's even on a simulated connection, you can see that it's like a 30 megabyte app. It takes quite a bit of time. So for all the people who laugh at you know, the 100 kilobyte or 200 kilobyte JavaScript application, 30 megabytes is quite a bit. And so what you end up with is a quite compromised experience. You go back, you, know, you click on the open uh, link, and actually what you can see is that when I, once I clicked open, I didn't even have any context of where I was going from in the first place. So now I have to go back to the original IM, click on the link. Now it says, oh, I see you have the app, so I'm not going to bother you about it again. Now I can go to the original URL that it was expecting, you know, click on the map application, and it will bring me to the Google Maps, which is the thing I wanted in the first place, right? So there is this weird bifurcation here, where this weird separation, where people, where people have to choose between getting a really quick initial re uh, rendering time, but a heavy reliance on the network every single time thereafter, or something that's resilient afterwards, but takes a very long time to download. And that's sort of the polarized world. That's the world that we live in. Um, and that really, frankly, sucks. So uh, I have jumped ahead many slides. I apologize. Um, what we, what we want to accomplish, uh, what the benefit of an SDK for the web is, is that it knows how your application works top to bottom. Um, you write an application one time in a declarative way, and then Ember can create different versions of your app from the same code. So before I get into how, I'm gonna, how we're going to solve the problem that I sort of laid out here, let's talk about how Ember already works today. So first of all, you get a, uh, from a single application, you get a, a production build, and that production build is optimized for production. It doesn't contain any debug assertions. It's minified. It's compressed. It contains any assets in line, if that makes sense. It contains all the assets from your application properly optimized for that, that setup. Um, you also get a development build, and that's the version that has all the asserts um, inside of it. It has, uh, it has all, the, all the, the custom server that serves things. It has live reload, right? It has your testing environment, right? So it's, it's a completely different environment from the same source code. 
Um, and more recently, we added another uh, build called the Fastboot build, which is a build that will run your application in Node.js and produce static pages to give to search engines, right? So these are three, di three completely different builds. If you looked at them, they would look nothing alike, coming from just one source code. And, those are three, and, and that's sort of something that you get from an SDK. And we can basically take that build, and we can run it in a lot of environments, uh, in the case of Fastboot, we can take, we can just install a single add-on, the Fastboot app server, and the Fastboot app server, because of the fact that Ember knows about the whole top-to-bottom story of your application, it can produce a whole new kind of environment. Um, obviously, we have to make Ember run reliably and effectively in the Node environment, and we have to separate out things in your application that shouldn't run in Node because they only make sense in the browser. But we were able to do all of that without any changes to your application at all. And I think that was, that's pretty, uh, pretty great. But where we're sort of going in the future, and sort of the answer to the earlier, how I set up the problem, is that we can do even more sophisticated slicing and dicing. Uh, for example, we can examine exactly what features you use and automatically trim out code for features that you didn't use. Um, but we can also, even more than that, we can figure out what features are need, what code is needed for a particular route, and we can stream in code for all the other routes only once the user has a fully interactive page. Uh, we can also determine what CSS is needed uh, by the components on that page and generate the critical CSS automatically. And um, there was a great talk at Ember at EmberConf by Martin uh, about Service Worker, and that's sort of the, the, another frontier, right? So once you have correctly taken, you've correctly sliced and diced the applications so that you have all these optimized payloads just for specific routes that you can give people. Um, you want to start downloading, as I said, you want to start downloading things in the background, and Service Worker allows you to start downloading the rest of the application in the background without doing anything to affect the, the main thread, the user's experience, and then the next time the user comes back, you can skip the network altogether. You should definitely check out Martin's talk for some stuff that the Ember community is already experimenting with and that will likely make its way into Ember eventually. So the way I think about it is that if you think about native SDKs, if you think about um, Coco, or if you think about the Android SDK, uh, or if you think about even like low-level programs, what you can do is you can take a single code base built in a specific language or framework, and you can compile it using heavy optimization. So there's the concept of GCC minus O3, which means I don't really care how long it takes to build this, make it as fast as humanly possible. And uh, what Ember wants to do is to be GCC minus O3 for the web. We take a single code base and we produce optimized versions for you. Um, because of the fact that an Ember application involves network, all the stuff I've been talking about, it actually involves, it's more complicated, right? We have to break it up into pieces that make sense to stream. We have to uh, work with servers that we know make sense, right? That, that will be smart enough to send things on demand. Um, but because we have a shared understanding of your entire app, Ember serves the same role as GCC minus O3. Uh, we take a single code base and we can produce many optimized builds for different requirements. So I think that's pretty great. So the idea is that by giving developers one modular programming model, you get all the modes from the same code base, all three of these modes, right? The basic HTML, which we could generate for you on the server, the initial interaction, which we can figure out by just following our nose to see what exact code is needed just to make that, that page interactive, and the resilience of all, the, of all your application, which we can get by downloading the JavaScript and the other assets in the background using Service Worker. And that means that we have to understand things like how your application boots, how your application is torn down. We have to understand how links work in your application, right? And that's sort of why it is that Ember has to think about all those things, how, why Ember has to care about it. So that's, that's, uh, that's sort of how we're thinking about it. But in order to understand why we're thinking about any of this, it's important to understand what is Ember for? So as a as a person in the audience, you probably have some preconceived notions about what kind of application you would use Ember for. And a lot of people always will say, you should use the best tool for the job, but then they don't tell you how to figure that out. So I'm going to start by telling you what I think today's Ember is, is best suited for on the desktop. Uh, so when it comes time to building desktop web applications, there's an, an age-old argument about the difference between web pages on the left, landing pages, and web applications on the right. Uh, what I called workspace applications before. And of course, as you know, there's a big continuum between these two things, right? So there's uh, things that are obviously single pages, very boring brochureware websites. There are things that are obviously applications like the Facebook application or the Roku dashboard. And then there's a lot in between. 
Um, so if you take a landing page, for example, you don't have a lot of pages, so you don't need a router, probably. Uh, you probably don't need services, and Ember data might not get you a lot. So a lot of people would say, most people would say, Ember would be overkill for a landing page. And in fact, if you look at the Ember website, or the Tilda website, or the Skylight website, any of the things I work on, all, none of those things use Ember, because it doesn't really make sense to use Ember for a static landing page. Um, on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, for things that are unquestionably applications, people actually do tend to use Ember quite a bit. Um, they know that they're building a sophisticated application and they're gonna need everything that Ember uh, gives you. And on the desktop, we actually see Ember used a lot in workspace applications. And a workspace application has, just for clarity, a bunch of characteristics that I think you'll probably find familiar. So first of all, it's typically behind some sort of authentication. Uh, it's not indexed by search engines. And in fact, if, you're, if a lot of these applications ended up getting indexed by search engines, that would probably end up being a bug. Right? You don't want your email or your private uh, user data to be indexed by a search engine. Um, also, these things are usually used more than a few minutes at a time. And that, again, means that your load times can be a little longer because they're amortized over half an hour or more. Uh, visitors also tend to be repeat visitors. Uh, and that means that you can count on many users having the JavaScript assets in their cache. Uh, on desktop, the caches are actually pretty reliable. And because, uh, and this is quite important, because there is so much functionality in these applications, they tend to be worked on by uh, bigger teams, uh, sometimes many teams inside of a company. And actually, if you look at applications like this, Ember wins a lot. Ember has a large percentage of these kind of applications, the workspace application. Uh, but unless you know that you're building something like this from out of the gate when you're starting in the first place, uh, people tend to view Ember as overkill. So here's a couple of tweets that I think uh, are correct, right? So the first guy says, Ember and Angular are clearly overkill for my requirements. I need something in the middle. And then uh, Andrea Pavoni replied, I prefer React plus Flux, smiley face. In my humble opinion, Ember is cool and complete, but also too bloated for the same reason, right? And, I, and as I said before, this is exactly the same reason that like the Ember website itself doesn't use Ember uh, for itself. So what about mobile? What's a, what, what do we mean when we're talking about mobile? And as I said before, mobile sort of has the same story. There's uh, landing pages, and those things are sort of like the domain of the AMP project from Google. They need to load really instantaneously, but you're on a hardware-constrained device. There are still applications. Applications still have a lot of functionality. Uh, they, they can be quite complex, actually. but. They, you can't rely on the fact that a user is going to stay in them for very long. So even though the, the user might go to many different pages over time, uh, you, you, need, you need things to still load very quickly. And if you switch away to answer a text message and come back, you have to deal with the fact that that might cause a reload and it still needs to load quite quickly. So on mobile, on desktop, sometimes people use it for landing pages. I've seen it and it's not totally crazy. Um, on mobile, for landing pages, a lot of times people will just say that Ember is flat out disqualified. Um, so uh, Malte Ubel, the person who works on the AMP project for Google, says, on a phone, one kilobyte of JavaScript roughly equals about one millisecond of UI thread stall, so size matters. And of course, that's true. So given that that's a problem, that downloading uh, you know, 500K of JavaScript, even if we don't worry about the network time, even if we can magically make the network time zero, just actually running the 500K of JavaScript takes half a second just to, just to run it. Uh, how do we make Ember work better in these environments? How do we make Workspace applications on mobile devices work better for Ember. So first I want to talk a little bit about what I've been doing, what we've been doing for the past uh, couple of years. And then I want to talk about how we're going to use that to make Ember better in the future. And by the way, I know a lot of you aren't using Ember, so some of you hopefully will check it out. But there's actually a lot of the things that are coming in the next part of my talk that I think uh, no matter what you're doing, you might find useful. You should think about how to incorporate them into the work that you're doing. Um, so first of all, what have we been doing? So uh, a couple of years ago, we started work on a project called Glimmer 1, which was basically just an attempt to change our templating engine so that instead of it being a bunch of templates compiled into a bunch of strings, uh, and Ember had really no idea about what was going on in the DOM until it was completely done, and that basically made the whole process a big black box that we had very little control over, um, changing that into uh, a templating engine, same syntax, uh, totally compatible, but change it into a templating engine that Ember had ability to understand, to introspect into. Um, there's a feature called Engines, and this feature basically is the way that 
applications with multiple teams can have people work on different applications, different parts of the application that get put together into one application once you're ready. Um, so this is a project that, was, that a bunch of different companies have helped to fund. Um, Dan Gebhardt, uh, who's on the core team, has been working on it uh, together with a bunch of community members. And the idea here is just to allow you to modularize a bigger application into pieces. Um, and you'll see in a minute why that is important for performance. Uh, also a long time ago, like years ago now, three years ago, we made Ember's entire ecosystem use JavaScript modules. The nice thing about JavaScript modules is that they declare, every module declares all of its inputs. So it's very easy to look at a module and follow the trail to what, uh, what all of its dependencies are. And uh, the last part thing that we've been working on is Fastboot. And the most important part of Fastboot is that it allows us to run Ember applications in other environments than the browsers that we support. So it made Ember a lot more flexible and able to run in more environments. Obviously, that has some of the, uh, the clear performance uh, benefits, but it will have some, uh, some less obvious ones that I'll get to soon. So about a year and a half ago, somewhere between a year and a half and two years ago, uh, LinkedIn decided that they were going to build their mobile application in Ember. And like two months after they made the decision, they called me up and they said, we're going to build our mobile application in Ember. And I said, that would not have been the first application that I would build as a company. Um, but what basically happened was that they had an existing application written in, I think, Backbone. And it was fast, fast enough, uh, met their performance requirements. But it was, had a very small team. It wasn't worked on very much. And they didn't add a lot of features because adding features often would cause performance regressions or a complexity explosion. So they had an application that, for the features that they wanted to support, had, enough, uh, had, a, had a good enough performance story. But adding features was very difficult for them. And what they really wanted to do was make their mobile application a first-class experience uh, on the web. And that meant adding a lot more of what LinkedIn does into this application. And they looked at the, the ecosystem and they said, um, there's, no, there's nothing that both is good at uh, handling dozens and dozens of engineers at the same time as being performing on mobile. And rather than try to figure out how to make some other framework more like Ember, uh, they decided to make Ember more performant. So they spent a lot of time uh, investing in Ember performance. And uh, that's sort of how I got involved uh, working with them, and why I started working on the Glimmer project. Now, one thing that's pretty interesting to me is that uh, LinkedIn has, they have a lot of testing for performance, uh, mostly against real world performance uh, story. And this is a thing that really drives me crazy, but I, but it's life. Um, they, one of the devices that they test on every single day, I look at every single day how Ember performs is the Galaxy S3. And they always say, oh, well, you can still buy it in Walmart or in India. I don't know if that's true. I think you can buy a better phone for like basically no money in India than the Galaxy S3 right now. But I guess people for some reason still buy it. So uh, they, there's a lot of them in the world and they test it. And so not only do they say, how does the application perform against the Galaxy S3, they say, how does the application perform against the 95th percentile on the Galaxy S3, which means like the one out of 20th slowest uh, users, how does it perform? And of course, the answer to that is going to be something like 15 seconds, because that's the slowest users on the slowest phones, right? But that has really put a lot of pressure on us to make Ember a lot faster. In the beginning, it was basically just didn't, it was untenable. Like no user would actually wait long enough to get the application to boot. And over time, we have gotten to a point where it's like tenable for someone using a very old phone in a very bad con condition to actually wait for the LinkedIn app to boot. Um, and th this is basically how I have a sense for how Ember is performing on quote unquote real hardware, uh, is that the application that I most work on and most optimized for performance actually has as the benchmark, uh, they, don't, they basically refuse to ship the new application to any phone that doesn't meet certain metrics at the 95th percentile. So we haven't shipped it to the Galaxy S3 yet, but we're working really hard at it. Now, another thing that's pretty cool, I think, about what's happening with LinkedIn is that uh, LinkedIn didn't want to fork Ember. They don't want to have their, a bunch of their own stuff that never gets back into Ember, but they have been doing a lot of experiments to see if they can make Ember faster. Um, specifically on mobile. And one thing that they have found is that just by reorganizing the way the modules are structured in the payload, so this is not reducing the number of modules, the amount of JavaScript that's being included, just by changing the order, changing the format, so uh, using strings instead of, instead of functions and then evaluating them as needed, um, eagerly loading common ones so that the loading of those doesn't interleave together with other <coughs> evaluation. Just by doing some optimizations like that, they have actually found a reliable 25% improvement end to end. So I don't just mean how much time it takes to ex execute Ember. I mean the amount of time that it takes from 
the, you know, zero milliseconds of navigation time all the way to the point where the application is painted, which is a, a bigger time than the number you're probably thinking about. In, in a desktop app, it could be a few seconds. Um, and we've gotten 25% improvement end-to-end -end just by reorganizing how the modules work. And uh, because of the fact that LinkedIn is so committed to being involved in the Ember ecosystem, a lot of these things are actually already being upstream. So Ember itself, the Ember CLI tool, without ha you having to make any changes to your code at all, will start seeing these improvements because of the, of the structure of our project. And in addition to things that they're doing in their project that they're upstreaming, uh, all of the things that I talked about before are also starting to pay real performance dividends. So Glimmer 1 gave us the ability to understand our own code, our own templating engine. We understood our own code, but it allowed us to understand your code as we're using it. And what Glimmer 2 does is it takes those same, that, that ability to understand and starts doing some very real optimizations, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, uh, engines, because of the fact that engines are completely isolated pieces of functionality uh, that different teams can work on, it becomes quite easy to say you can lazily load an entire engine. So you can imagine maybe you have an admin section of your page that nobody ever uses. Um, you, you can make that an engine in your application. You can have a team work on that. And then as soon as the user clicks on the uh, URL that points at the admin section, then we'll go download it. And the nice thing about that is that because the routing system in Ember is already asynchronous, usually you require some asynchronous data fetching. Um, adding in an asynchronous code loading step is not very, doesn't change anything at all. So uh, simply by us saying there's a way to write a piece of your app that is completely isolated from the other part of your app, perhaps with, uh, other than some explicit uh, dependencies on the parent, um, it is now very easy for us to lazily load that chunk. And because LinkedIn has already been breaking up their app into engines because of their multiple teams, they are going to start seeing some lazy loading performance wins uh, very soon. And uh, JavaScript modules, like I said before, that, has, that means that everyone is always saying what things they depend on. Um, that allows us to actually start doing some what people call tree shaking, like follow the path and just delete code that isn't being used. Um, so we haven't really landed any, any of those features yet, but that's sort of the next big frontier after, after we land Glimmer 2, which is what we're working on right now, uh, is to start taking advantage of how much information there is in the module imports to try to reduce the amount of code that we need to download. And this last one is actually pretty interesting. Uh, so Fastboot, the way you're think, you think about it is that it's an, a thing that allows you to get some HTML ahead of time and maybe give, it to a, a, maybe give it to a search engine or maybe give it to your user and then rehydrate. But what LinkedIn uses it for is just, they just run it on the server uh, enough to figure out what data is going to be fetched by the user. And then they just start streaming the data right away instead of having to wait for the Ember application to boot. So normally, the way an Ember application works is you download the Ember code, you download the application, you boot the application, you start routing, and when you start routing, you see what data you need. But that, of course, puts that data fetching behind a bunch of, uh, a bunch of other downloads, other, other steps. Uh, whereas what LinkedIn does is they say, we basically run the exact same request, just the routing part on the server, and then as soon as we know what data we're going to need, we start streaming it right away into the client. So by the time the client has, start, has finished booting the Ember application, almost all the time they already have all the data that they need as well. And that also has been a very significant improvement. And they call that optimization big pipe. And these are all things that are uh, moving into Ember's tooling uh, by default. So Glimmer 2 is the thing that I personally work on. It's my project uh, in Ember. And uh, it's a rewrite of the rendering engine um, that we worked on last year. And just to give you some context of why that matters, I realize I'm a little behind on time, but I will I think I can do this. Uh, so Glimmer 1 was a uh, new rendering engine we, I, we wrote for EmberConf 2015. And it was written in JavaScript. It was a very small core. And the important thing about it was that it, the components in Glimmer 1 were all implemented in Ember. So that meant that it was a very small core of rendering engine stuff, but most of the way that you think about working with an Ember application was implemented in Ember. Um, and a thing that was pretty annoying about that was that because of the exact place where the boundary was, we actually didn't get a lot of the performance wins that we thought we would get, because by the time we finished adding the Ember compatibility on top, we sort of added back in all the things that were slow about Ember in the first place. So uh, we had this very nice core that you could do very nice benchmarks against, but the whole, em whole Ember application, while it got very much faster at updating, so Glimmer 1 was any routine 10 and 100 times faster at updating, uh, than, than uh, the old rendering engine. But for initial rendering performance, it was actually a little slower um, initially, and we, we've made it faster now, but it was initially a little slower. So Glimmer 2 said, okay, well, we're not going to 
We're not going to try to do that again. We need to make initial rendering performance fast, and that was, that was the goal of Glimmer 1, was to make initial rendering fast. This is, of course, important for mobile. And so uh, what we did, first of all, was, and I'll talk about why all these things, uh, we, wrote it, we wrote it in TypeScript instead of JavaScript. Um, it's, you can think of it as a rendering engine engine. So instead of it being a special rendering engine, it's actually an engine that you can use to build other rendering engines. One of them happens to be the Ember rendering engine. And importantly, if you look across the ecosystem at like em Ember, Angular, React, uh, Aurelia, Vue.js, all these systems have something called a component. So there's really no reason to not put components in, the, in a core rendering engine, right? So uh, Glimmer 2 has components as a core part of the system, and that has allowed us to make the components themselves heavily optimized, where in Glimmer 1, they were sort of tacked on top. So Glimmer 1 was really the small set of primitives. Uh, it didn't have any notion of a component. And if you're familiar with Ember, most of the APIs that you use in Ember were a, f a big stack of extra stuff on top of Glimmer 1 that, you, that was written in Ember. Whereas Glimmer 2 sort of take, uh, is, the, is the whole view layer core extracted into a separate library. And it's actually kind of ironic because at the same time as we're taking uh, a lot of things that were used to be in Ember and moving them to Glimmer, Glimmer itself is actually becoming more useful as a general purpose abstraction. So you can write things like React or Vue.js. You can write those things in terms of Glimmer if you would want to. Uh, so it's becoming both a lot more low level, but also a lot more complete in terms of the number of things that it uh, knows how to understand. Uh, Glimmer 2 is, uh, has, we've been working on it for a long time now. Um, it's already uh, in Canary. There's a few features that we still have le left to do. Mostly, it's mostly tests of very, very old functionality that no new application uses, but which we have to uh, make work in order to ship. So you can check out our progress here um, on this issue number 13644. Uh, and that's uh, called the Glimmer Preflight Checklist. Uh, we're not going to go that feature. We're not going to stabilize that feature uh, until after the 2.8 release. Uh, the 2.8 release is actually an LTS release, and you wouldn't want to ship a whole new rendering engine together with an LTS release, so we're not going to do that. But pretty soon after 2.8, uh, which is now like a week away, we're going to have a 2.9 alpha, and the 2.9 alpha should have Glimmer in it, and you can test it out in your applications. Uh, or if you haven't used Ember yet, you can test it out to see what the performance will look like. And Glimmer 2 is actually quite exciting in terms of the rendering performance that we get, but it also has some other exciting implications. Um, so Tan's been working on uh, a project for the past few weeks called uh, Monograph, and this is an application that he's been working on uh, for his company that's designed to be shared on social media by celebrities, politicians, and any other people with social media following. Um, they call it an MCAST, and it's, the idea is that it delivers an instant loading, native feeling app on the web. Uh, so here is an application. Um, it's, an app it's an example of an MCAST configured to collect donations for the Hillary Clinton campaign in the United States. And uh, they're talking to the campaign in hopes that they might use it. And in this case, uh, the application actually only has one page. So it's overkill to include a router, like I said before. The only data in is a streaming video. And the only data out is, an anal is via analytics libraries and the Stripe API to actually send the money. So Ember Data and other services are also overkill. And so uh, Tom wasn't going to use Ember for this. Yeah. I guess if you see Donald Trump, you might want to give Hillary Clinton money. And the idea behind this, kind of, this application is that it's designed to go where native applications can't. For example, inside of Twitter, right? So inside of Twitter, uh, you're not going to ask someone to please download the Hillary Clinton native application that might take you know, 10 megabytes if you're very, very... Uh, careful about size, you need something that can load right away directly from Twitter, Facebook, or other things. So they have, to worry, they have to worry a lot about instant performance. And basically what happened here is that uh, Tom talked to his boss, and Tom said, uh, look, we know that the most important constraint here is load time. It has to be as close to instant as possible. Uh, we know that Ember is too big for this use case, so we're not going to use Ember. But at the same time, Ember is really productive, and, they, and everybody who worked at his company really likes Ember. And it, as people have experienced, once you got used to the Ember ecosystem, it feels very painful to go back and roll your own from scratch. Um, so Tom knew that I was working on, on Glimmer 2, and he also knew that I was intending for it to be usable in a standalone way, although right now we're working on Ember, so it uh, <laughs> seems scary. But <clears throat> Tom knew that it, was gonna be, that it was meant to be used standalone, so he convinced his boss, hey, give me a week. 
I'm going to try to use Glimmer 2 as a standalone thing. And if I can successfully do it, then we'll, we should use Glimmer 2 as a standalone thing. Otherwise, we can go back, we can use React, vanilla JS, whatever. So the way they actually built it was using Ember CLI. Uh, you, people probably don't know this, but Ember CLI is actually really general as a build tool. A lot of the libraries that Ember uses use it. Um, Angular CLI is actually based on Ember CLI. So Ember CLI is really general. It's um, even more general than things like Webpack. So he used Ember CLI. Uh, like I said, he used Glimmer 2, did not use Ember.js, and did not use jQuery. And basically all of that meant that they got a nice, uh, they got a nice small payload. And because they leaned on Ember CLI, so they didn't use Ember, but they used Ember CLI, uh, they were able to tap into the ecosystem pretty easily. So uh, they were able to get SAS, for example, very easily by installing the regular SAS plugin. But they were also able, with a single line of code, to get app cache support, which is key to making these things load uh, instantly. So they used bro Broccoli app cache to automatically generate an app cache manifest with literally one line of code. And they also used uh, TypeScript, which is another thing that has a Broccoli plugin. So Broccoli is the thing that lives right underneath Ember CLI and is the main way that people write uh, these general plugins like SAS or TypeScript. So they were able to add SAS compilation, app cache support, and TypeScript support in just a few lines of code, which I made them feel uh, back to where they felt productive. And because the whole thing was so slimmed down, they actually got really good time to first paint even on older Android devices. So this is a 2013 Android device, and they got time to first paint under you know, around half a second, which is quite good. Um, and this is a visceral sense of what it looks like. Here's a video from webpagetest.org. Uh, again, remember that this is a few-year-old Android device, and we get usable UI in about a second and fully rendered UI in under three seconds. This is without any kind of server-side rendering at all, which they're considering as a additional optimization for this application. So like I said, Tom told his boss that he wants to have a, he, he's giving himself a week to build the application and has to meet these stringent uh, speed requirements but also these stringent uh, size requirements. And after about a week of hacking, he had something working and he was pleasantly surprised that not only was it fast like I showed you before, it was also small. And in fact, uh, Glimmer 2 as a standalone thing is smaller than React, but not only was uh, Glimmer 2 smaller than React, even when you add the application in on top of Glimmer 2, the application plus Glimmer 2 together was smaller than the uh, minified and gzip size of just React on its own. And one thing to note here is that a big part of what React does, a big part of its size, is uh, event handling, and especially in, in, in particular, handling events for IE8, so older browsers, which React still supports. But in this case, uh, Tom didn't need really old browser event handling support, and so he was able to use just a regular DOM event handling, and that allowed him to uh, shave off quite a bit of, of size. And so all of his application, all of his templates, all of that, plus the Glimmer 2 itself was uh, fit into something that was smaller than the React size. Um, and actually, uh, me and Godfrey, who work on Glimmer 2, this is sort of like that size is sort of like we didn't, haven't even thought about file size at all. It wasn't part of the goal. We have some ideas for optimizing that should radically shrink the size of Glimmer 2 as a standalone thing. Right now, there's a lot of extra uh, rep repetitive code <clears throat> that we could shrink if we wanted to focus on file size, which we do. And one of the really great things about their setup is that once they were done setting up the infrastructure, they had an experience that, while significantly pared down, would feel very familiar to any Ember developer. Um, Tom's teammates, Will Bagby and Hassan Abdel Rahman, were able to quickly add additional functionality. And here's an example of them adding um, Apple Pay support in iOS 10 pretty soon after it came out. Um, and the, obviously, this is an application that, in which you would like to uh, pay people uh, would you like to pay Hillary some money in exchange for seeing a very angry Trump email, a uh, Trump video? And the faster that you can get someone's money, the better. So web payments is actually pretty cool. And Android, uh, the Android uh, platform is also getting web payments. So pretty soon, uh, iOS and Android will both have web payments. And this is something that, of course, for their use case, this is highly important. And they were able to add it very quickly on top of the setup that they already had. And when I say that the experience that they had was pretty Ember-like, I think any person who has either used handlebars before or Ember would find uh, this template pretty familiar. It's pretty much a standard vanilla handlebars template. And that's because so Glimmer uh, incorporates all the things that are interesting about the handlebars uh, story, as well as all the things that are interesting about Ember components, are all included in Glimmer. So you're, you're able to do something that looks quite similar. So. Me and Tom have both been working on real applications for the last uh, couple of years that I have to work on real mobile devices. Um, 
Tom's experience extracting Glimmer from Ember was a manual process, but this shows that smart enough build tools uh, should be able to do the kind of code elimination that we need for you, um, producing smaller file sizes if you use fewer features. And what we expect is that over time, Ember will become more pay-as-you-go. And I want to talk a little bit about what steps we're taking to make that real. So just as a reminder, the thing that we're trying to accomplish here is to take one application that you write, one single application, and break it up into three pieces. The initial content delivered for you for the page you're looking at, just the critical JavaScript needed for the interaction, and then once that's done, in the background, having the ser a service worker download the additional assets so that anytime you come back to the application, if your operating system kills it, it will still load instantly. So first of all, in order to, do, to get down to the, just a minimal JavaScript, we need to use JavaScript modules. Good news, Ember applications already do that. Um, and uh, so all of your applications already declare the dependencies amongst itself uh, so that we can do tree shaking for you. But there's a slight snag here, which is that we have a large amount of dependencies. So even though people think of Ember as really quite monolithic, actually we have a ton of dependencies that we've built over the years that uh, other frameworks have used sometimes. And many of these, uh, if you go look at these, it's kind of like an archaeology project. It's like, oh, I guess, like, Grunt was popular in 2012, so that thing is built using Grunt or Gulp or whatever. Actually, we don't use those tools. But um, whatever thing happened to be popular in 2012 or 2013 or 14 might be used in, in one of these tools. And so really, we need to make sure that all of the tools that we use as dependencies use ES6 modules as their main way of describing dependencies so that we can really do a full tree shake of, all, of the entire Ember instead of having these big black boxes that we don't know how to um, understand. And that work is ongoing, uh, has been going apace. Uh, Glimmer 2 was the first project that we wrote in TypeScript, and we really got a lot of value out of it, and it's something that we're probably going to think about using internally. Um, for Ember, TypeScript, the thing that was good about it for framework code is, first of all, it catches bugs. And what I mean by that is not just the usual way in which the type system catches bugs, but it, allowed, it made it really easy for us to build in Glimmer 2 interfaces that we thought were probably going to be public APIs, but we weren't sure what they were going to be yet, and change those interfaces over time and properly refactor all the code that depended on them. So historically, at least for me when I write code in JavaScript, if I use a lot of interfaces, it becomes very difficult to make sure that I've correctly cleaned up all the code when I change them. So the early interfaces become the permanent ones, and that's not great or I just use a lot more, many more concrete types, right? So I use a few concrete types that are allowed to change because they're explicit. And both of those things are not really great for writing uh, modular code for things like Glimmer 2. So the fact that TypeScript makes it really easy to write interfaces and then the tooling around it, especially Visual, especially Visual Studio Code, makes it really easy to go say, oh, I want to rename this thing or I want to uh, change this whole section here to a different object. The fact that you can do that very easily, refactor quickly without uh, knowing that you didn't make any mistakes is something that has allowed us to both keep the code really decoupled and at the same time uh, iterate on it pretty quickly during a time where it's still in active development. Um, the second thing that has been really great for us is that it has improved the performance of our code. And this is because a lot of the interesting questions that V8 makes you care about when you care about V8 performance are actually possible to express in TypeScript in the type system. So uh, some of it is just natural. The way that TypeScript wants you to write code naturally is optimized better. Some of it we have to express explicitly. But because we're able to do that, it's, pretty, it's much easier for us to avoid accidentally regressing. Um, one thing that I want to say about your own applications is that we do not want you to be forced to write TypeScript in your own applications. Um, we realize that there are people who like it and people who don't. Um, and in fact, I would personally not necessarily want to make, use TypeScript as the, for new prototype applications starting off. Um, so uh, the idea is that Ember itself will always be a JavaScript first design process. So if you write an RFC, design a new API, you should always design it as a, as a JavaScript API. Um, but we really want to make TypeScript something that is very, like anybody who wants to use it gets a really good experience using TypeScript with Ember. Um, it actually turns out that TypeScript is designed for this, right? TypeScript is a gradual type system, which is supposed to mean that you can use JavaScript and incrementally add TypeScript on top. Um, so I think Ember, Ember is going to be fine with that strategy, and I'm, it's a little unfortunate that um, other people using TypeScript are using it as a more of a mandatory uh, way that you have to write code. I think that sort of, it makes you lose the track on what TypeScript is good at. TypeScript is good at being a gradual type system that you can opt into as you need, um, and it's especially good at taking JavaScript ap uh, APIs of any shape and making them ha uh, have nice types and you have good IDE support. So the object model is probably the biggest 
thing that is important to Ember that uh, Tom didn't use in his, in his application, but it's quite difficult to build Ember applications without it. So this is a, a piece of code. If you haven't seen Ember before, you might look at this and actually have no idea how to parse it, even though it is valid JavaScript. Um, but this is basically how you build an Ember object today. And I've been working quite hard with TC39 to standardize more features of ES6 classes so that it's easier to transition us to an ES6 story. So here's a hypothetical version of what this might look like with uh, JavaScript classes and decorators. And the important thing here is that not only can we delete a whole bunch of code, right? So, and I don't mean we can delete it because people still have applications and we need to support them. I mean in the sense that if you don't use the feature, you won't have to have the 10 or 20K of code that supports the left side, right? So again, it's, it should be very clear. No plans to actually break anybody's apps that are using the features on the left. We, are very, we care a lot about compatibility. But the idea is that you can write something that will uh, both ha use less code, but also feel more familiar to people coming from other parts of the JavaScript ecosystem, right? People will already know what the class syntax looks like. They'll already know what uh, the method syntax looks like. And hopefully, they'll already have encountered decorators in some way. So uh, we think that this is going to be a nice way of both simplifying Ember itself and also simplifying how people experience it. But there is kind of an elephant in the room, though. Um, even if we make this file size of a simple application tiny by magic, uh, people will still feel overwhelmed just learning Ember. Uh, they sort of look at Ember, and there's this big list of things that you have to learn just to get started. Um, it turns out that when people succeed using Ember, in the first, uh, when, once people succeed using Ember, uh, learning it, they usually love it and keep using it for more projects. But a lot of people don't try because it feels so intimidating. People get dropped into the deep end of, a, of an API surface area and feel like they're just struggling to understand uh, anything, and they have to understand all the things in order to get, even get something simple started. And um, Obviously, em experienced Ember developers look at the abstraction and say, oh, I know what's going on here. There's all these nice layers. I know how to use them. But as a new developer coming into Ember for the first time, you just see this big cross-section of the entire API surface, and you have no idea how to get started. And when you give someone an abstraction that they, and they don't understand why they need it, it's worse than useless. It makes it harder to learn, and often it feels like people are fighting against it. So what's a proposed alternative to this? So a proposed alternative is... BYO framework, bring your own framework. You start with a small core, like Backbone or React, and then layer on the abstractions you need as you need them. Um, this feels really great at first, but it has some real shortcomings. First of all, you have to integrate all the pieces yourself. Uh, the glue code that bridges two different libraries can really add up when they aren't designed to work together, and it gets worse the more libraries you throw into the mix. Um, second, when you have too much variation in how applications are architected, you can't build automated tools that slice and dice and optimize your application in different ways. It would be like asking GCC to compile and optimize your program when everyone's app was written in different syntax. So uh, React is obviously in use by way more app, uh, sites than Ember, but I would actually bet that Ember is more popular than any particular permutation of React, Redux, Flaw, Flux, MobX. Flob is available. You should new React name. Uh, there, there's many combinations and any particular stack of you know, React, Redux, Flux, MobX, et cetera, uh, it, I would bet has a smaller number of users than Ember as a, as a stack. Uh, for example, let's look at one hypothetical web application use, uh, built using the BYO framework approach. So of course, you need Gulp because you need to have a build tool. Um, you need React, obviously. You need Redux, because, and you, there's a great talk about this later today. You need Redux for state management, uh, Redux storage to store stuff. Uh, you need Babel, because, of course, you want new features of JavaScript. You need Immutable.js, because everyone knows Immutable is the hot new thing, and it's how you're supposed to use Redux. Uh, you need a router, because you're building an actual application. But unfortunately, Redux and React Router don't work perfectly together, so you should you add Re React Router Redux. Thankfully, someone has written the integration for us. That's great. Uh, we need internationalization. Uh, Express for server-side rendering. Uh, Format.js for more internationalization. React Helmet to put things in the head. I love that name. Uh, <laughs> Fave icon. We need Raven.js. Short ID. Uh, of course, we haven't even gotten to CSS yet. We need auto prefixers so things work across all the browsers. Mocha for testing. Uh, Bluebird for promises. We need Validator.js. Of course, you don't want to write bad JavaScript, so ESLint is very important. Uh, Webpack, because why, uh, why have one when you could have two build tools? Uh, we need, of course, isomorphic tools, although probably that will be renamed to universal tools any day now. Um, and in case you think I'm just trolling here, in case you think, oh, well, obviously no one would ever build something like that, um, Tom actually found this particular stack in a uh, React boilerplate that he found on the internet that seems popular called Este. Um, 
And I think that means that we're, what we're saying here is the applications just are complicated. They involve a lot of pieces, and putting them all together is, is, a, is a hard job. This is not a troll. This is not me saying um, rea uh, people who build React have this totally ridiculous thing. This is not ridiculous at all. This is just a bunch of tools that are needed to build the right thing. And if that's not to your liking, uh, we found a list aggregating all of React boilerplates available. Um, this is a very long list. Um, when Tom gave this talk, he had it scroll for a while, and that was very funny. But um, the critique here is not in, there's, I think, 60 different boilerplates, and they're nicely tagged and organized, and they tell you how many stars there are and everything like that. So this critique is not intended to pick on anyone. Um, the bottom line is that it's just really hard to build tools that can optimize the delivery of an application the way I've been talking about this whole time when you have so much fragmentation in how they're architected, right? So uh, if there's so many different ways in how you put together an application, doing this, right, breaking things up into the pieces that we want to uh, break them up into becomes quite hard. You have to standardize on one version of the stack and then build that tool on top of it. And the story with Ember is that by giving developers a single modular programming model, you get all the three modes from the same code base. Uh, because we have a conventional structure for everything from how apps boot all the way to how they're torn down, we can break your app into pieces and serve it to the browser just in time. Um, this means that you don't have to split, manually split your code uh, like in progressive enhancement or write any of this infrastructure yourself. It also means that we can run in other environments like Node.js pretty easily. Um, but we understand that even though, like I said, we can do magic, not everyone wants to start with the full Ember stack. So it's a major goal for me and Godfrey once we ship Glimmer 2 as part of Ember to make uh, Glimmer easy to use as a standalone library optionally with Ember CLI the way Tom used it. Uh, there are a lot of use cases for this, uh, from writing reusable components, cross-framework uh, UI components, or incrementally retrofitting older server-side web apps that cannot be rewritten from scratch. But it is very important to us that if we have people starting off writing a Glimmer application, that there's a nice path to going to an Ember application. As your app grows, instead of every single time you want to add a new thing, having to become a domain expert in that thing so you can pick from the 16 available options for that thing and then repeat it over and over and over again, we really want to have a sanctioned path from standalone component to a page to a full application every step of the way. And there's a kind of interesting thing happening here. <clears throat> um, React is focused on radical simplicity. In fact, I hear people describe React not as being a library for building web applications, but instead as a library for describing UI components that just happens to have a DOM adapter. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, Angular 2 describes itself as a platform of capabilities supporting JavaScript, TypeScript, and Dart, cross-platform development with React Native and NativeScript, a new CLI tool, a new data library, another new router, um, RxJS built in, and more. And for the first time, Ember is actually in the middle. We're not trying to solve the problem of cross-platform app development. We're not trying to become uh, the new paradigm for how everyone builds applications across all platforms. We're just trying to give developers the most pragmatic solution for building apps on the web. Uh, we think of Ember as being an SDK for the web. It's all the tools that you need to build great web experiences. We don't want to be a platform. We want to be an SDK for the platform that you already love. Uh, an SDK that helps you manage complexity and helps you deliver the instant on experience users expect. In other words, we want to build a solution that doubles down on the web strengths. We believe that web applications are not just good enough, they have real advantages over App Store encumbered applications. And in Ember, we have a productive, well thought out framework with a vibrant community. We don't need radical change, we don't need to reboot everything, uh, run for the hills, um, and we don't need to try to turn Ember into the dominant paradigm for writing apps for all platforms. What we need to do as a framework is to focus on speed, size, getting new developers started, and reaching new audiences that couldn't use Ember before. Uh, me and Tom always said we wanted to build a framework that would last a decade or longer, and we're about half a decade in now, and we couldn't be more excited about both the future of Ember as a thing that has evolved from very humble beginnings in 2011, and also the future of the web. Thank you very much. Do I have time to take a few questions? Okay, two questions. Hi, Yuta. Thanks for enlightening us on Glimmer and Amber. So Hello. my question was, uh, so you're building on Glimmer 2, right? So yeah. is there any community support that we can, you know, uh, have on Glimmer 2? Because I'm a new developer to Glimmer, I'm uh, trying to uh, try hands on on that. So, is there any community support I can find, like Stack Exchange uh, account or some Slack uh, channel? Is there any? Uh, so, right now, there's no doing what Tom did 
when Tom gave this talk, he said, like, the high voltage, don't try this at home. Uh, stunt driver on a closed course. Um, Glimmer 2 right now, while it is in fact a separated library with a public API, is still changing too quickly, I think, for many people to try to use it for something of their own, unless they were trying to contribute to Ember or Glimmer. Um, I think the easiest way, uh, ultimately, to use Glimmer will basically be to use uh, Ember CLI with just Glimmer, and we'll have, like, the Ember website will have a, how to get started with just Glimmer, and you'll have a story for that, and it will be uh, well, as well documented as, as the rest of Ember, and, but, but it won't include all the rest of Ember, so you'll just look at it, you'll have build tools that you need, um, you'll have the setup that you need, you'll have the nice production mode, all that stuff, um, but you won't have to work, learn, learn about routing or Ember data or anything like that. Um, eventually, and, I, and this is a goal that we have after Ember finishes integrating Glimmer 2 completely and we ship it into production, which will hopefully cross your fingers be 2.9, but I can't promise that. Um, we want Glimmer to be a nice project that has a good public API, but I, I'll just say that I personally expect that Glimmer, the main people who use Glimmer uh, as a public API will be people building other tools on top. So obviously Ember will be the primary one, but you can imagine like a Glimmer Redux or um, a Glimmer MobX or, or any of these tools. Um, we've totally built Glimmer to be a good fit for those kind of things, and I expect that to happen. So um, I would say if you're interested in like getting your hands dirty with Glimmer like as a contributor, um, there's a, a lot of open issues on the Glimmer repo. It's under tilde.io slash Glimmer. There's some, some really good documentation about the primitives under the, I think it's guides directory. And there are a bunch of, in Ember, there's pre, the pre-flight checklist and other issues talk a lot about what's going on. But uh, if you're not trying to get involved as a contributor, you want to use it, I would say wait for us to say something in public about how you're supposed to do that. And yeah, then there probably will be uh, Stack Overflow tags and things like that. And uh, about service worker, you said that you will be trying to implement service workers in the mobile app development because it's a new technology, it's very popular and it's very you know, performance savvy. Yep. So are you planning to integrate service workers some way or the other in ember.js or Glimmer uh, 2? Yes, so there, there's already a, a plugin for Ember called Ember CLI Service Worker, uh, which is written by Dockyard. And as I said, there's a talk by Martin that you can watch that's great mm -hmm. uh, about it. Um, one thing that you should know about Service Worker is that it's a low-level primitive, and it's very easy to install a Service Worker and then accidentally cache your app in a state that can never be cleared forever. So you could have users that have to like literally go clear their browser's storage settings to get to clear the cache. So you you don't really want to be writing Service Worker yourself. Ember CLI Service Worker is a nice tool for um, building pieces of Service Worker for things like caching, push notifications, etc. That you could composed together. Um, and I think for a while, the Ember community will probably use that plugin. Eventually, the plan is to integrate it directly into Ember so that we can have sort of an out-of-the-box story for that one, two, and three phase that you just you know, build your Ember app, follow the rules, and uh, Sorry? Ember, you, your users will automatically get that phasing for free. So that's the plan. It's going to be fun. All right. OK. One more question. One more question right over here in the front. Uh, let's get a mic, Dave. Hi, Yoda. Hello. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for Mob, Rails, and Amber. Uh, my question is uh, more emotional. Uh, we are finding less and less frameworks being built here in India. And you being one who built Mob and then supported Rails framework and now doing Amber. So what would be your advice to the Java's community over here and technologists to build some sort of framework. What we should do to actually come up with something good enough to be usable in the community and we can start something around it. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I think one thing that I, I'll answer my question, your question selfishly. Uh, the Ember community, unlike, so if you look at Angular or React, they're mostly uh, being developed inside of a San Francisco based company and it's very difficult to get involved in it. One thing that I really like about Ember is that there's really no one company that dominates it at all. There's, really, there's probably like 10 different companies represented on the core team and maybe like another 50 companies that are actively contributing to Ember. Um, and LinkedIn in a very short amount of time, like under a year, has gone from being a user of Ember to being one of the main contributors to Ember. Uh, 
And that, a lot of that has to do with the fact that our RFC process is totally open. So I, if you want to contribute to Ember, you, have, you and I have to go through exa the exact same process. So I have to write an RFC, I have to convince the community, I have to debate it, and eventually we might approve it after the debate has died down. You do the exact same thing. Um, and I, we're going to continue to make it more and more async. We've been doing some work, uh, a lot of work on making the translations of Ember's guides really uh, decentralized so that Ember, like I don't have to worry about all the translations all the time because that would make it go very slow. I think people have probably experienced that. So uh, Lox on the Learn team has been working on a really good decentralized architecture for, for the translations. Um, I think basically what I would say is if you are interested in having companies here or people here be uh, important in, in frameworks, it, the easiest thing to do would be to contribute to Ember. And I, again, I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that in the sense that anyone could say that. I'm saying that in the sense that Ember as a project already has a lot of international uh, core team members, um, people who are not from the United States, and I'm very interested in continuing that to be the case. Uh, at least for, for Ember, it's very important to me that we have as people um, involved in the process of building Ember who represent as many uh, constituencies as possible, and for sure, right now, uh, represent, representing person who uses the internet in India is not represented enough, and it would be easy for that uh, someone who represented that interest and worked on it to become important in the in the Ember project. So, um, I would do that. In terms of starting your own thing, it's hard. I like you can. Uh, it's probably its own talk, but I I think probably an easy like for me getting started with my own stuff, it, uh, st I started out by getting involved in other people's stuff and learning from projects that seem to do a good job at building big communities. Um, I would say that the main rule that you should follow is, it, is not just does this thing have a lot of users, but is this thing developed in the open by a lot of people, a lot of different groups. Um, and I think Ember has a really good story there. And I think if you want to build something of your own, especially if it's not hosted in the middle of San Francisco, you're going to want to build something that's very... Uh, that, has, that has the capability of being very dispersed in terms of the, the number of people building it. So, yeah. So join yeah. Ember and then build cool stuff also. Yeah. Surely. We are doing a lot of contributions around, so we'll surely join. Thank, Thank you very you much so for your time. Thanks. Awesome. Thank All you. Right. Thank you.